All right, welcome everybody. Welcome to Rusty Days. Um, let's get started. I'm Jan Eric. I'm your speaker today. Um, I am a Firefox telemetry engineer on Firefox working at Mozilla. Um, I'm also a Rust community team member, and sometimes I even go scuba diving. You'll find me online, and you even find the slides online already. I'll link them later on Twitter and the chat as well. When I'm not doing any of the mentioned things, I also organize Rust conferences. I do organize the European conference Rust Fest, and just as Rusty Days, it should have hap had happened as an in-person conference this year. It should have been in the Netherlands, but unfortunately, that didn't happen. It's still happening this year, though. It's going to be online, and it's going to be in November, so stay tuned for more information on that as well. I've started looking at Rust in 2014. That's six years ago. I like to make the joke that back then, we barely just got version numbers on Rust releases. We really come a long time since then. Today, I'm here to talk about how my team at Mozilla, the Telemetry team, built a cross-platform library we call Glean, you deployed that to at least four different platforms, and integrated that with six programming language. And we still feel like we can maintain all of this. Let's start off with some background around this project. We will get to some actual Rust code later. And if you're watching this on the recording afterwards, you could skip ahead. But if you're on the live stream or actually interested in all of this, please bear with me. I'm making sure this is interesting for all of you. So let's talk about Firefox telemetry. What is that? Firefox does collect data about how it's used. We collect those in performance metrics for the product that is Firefox desktop. We then bundle up these metrics into what we call pings. That's essentially just a bundle of all these metrics that we can send out as one big thing. When doing this, we follow what we call the lead data practices. Let me get into a little bit more detail so you understand what's happening. This shows the graph of one of the metrics you collect. This metric is the time spent running the JavaScript garbage collector. The engineers behind the JavaScript engine want to know how the garbage collector actually behaves. Most of our developers on Firefox actually run some high-end laptop, a MacBook, or ThinkPad, or something else. So on their laptop, obviously, most of the time, it actually runs fast. But they can't test on all the hardware that's out there. So we, they want to see the data that's coming in from actual users and how it behaves. So by collecting the time the, uh, the garbage collector takes to run on any arbitrary website a user might visit, they can make decisions whether they are satisfied with the performance or not. There might be outliers in either direction, but as you can see in this graph, it um, is more or less a normal distribution. And I guess for them, this is what they're aiming for. Now, this is just a single metric. But this is already useful to describe what we're doing, because this is only about a technical data point inside the browser. This is not user data, but this is usage data. We don't want to collect any data about the user specifically. We only want to collect data that tells us how the browser is actually behaving. To make sure we stay true to this, we follow what we call the lean data practices. The lean data practices essentially split, split into three principles. The first of all is staying lean. We only want to collect this, the data that actually answers questions. So whenever we do want to collect data, we always start with a question we'd like to get answered. We also make decisions how and for how long we collect this data. We only need it most of the time to actually answer a question. And we had, when we have this question, we probably don't need that data anymore. The second principle is building security. As I mentioned before, we really don't want to track or collect any data about our users. We want only to see how the browser is behaving. So, we don't even collect any data that would identify any users in any detail. 
And last but not least, we want to engage our users. Just as the Firefox code base itself, the data collection code and data about the um, how we do all of this is freely available. Users can look at what the browser does. And on top of that, users can also look at what their browser specifically is collecting. And last but not least, and most important, we will always make it easy and possible for the user to actually opt out of this and not send us this data if they are not feeling comfortable doing so. We always follow these principles and we actually have people that ensure that every data we collect follow these principles. If you're interesting, interested more in um, the behavior behind all of that and the ideas behind all of that, you should check a talk um, by my colleague Chatton um, titled Collecting Data Responsibly and at Scale. It's from last year's StarCon 2019 and it really uh, is a really good resource to describe how we do this. So to summarize a bit and to describe what telemetry is in a very internet compatible boring way is, well, we're actually just storing some integers and then send them JSON encoded to a server. That's about all we do. Now, when I joined Mozilla in 2018, there were two developments happening. The data teams at Mozilla decided that the current system wasn't good enough anymore, and they needed to build a new system to support um, data collection for uh, Mozilla products in the future. We knew about more products than just the desktop browser, and we needed a system that can scale through the size of a browser population of millions of users. We also gathered feedback from the developers that need to use this telemetry collection and also the analysts that need to finally look at the data. The outcome out of, out of all of this is Glean, which is uh, the new development going all the way from the SDK, that's the code that's actually landing in the products, over to the pipeline, which ingests the data, um, puts it in the database, and maybe transforms it to some extent, and then also the tooling to analyze and look at this data. This is all summed up in the Clean project. If you're interested in a lot more details there, check out the Introducing Glean blog post by Georg. The second thing that was also happening is that our mobile teams decided to build out a new uh, version of the Firefox for Android browser. They wanted to build this new version of the browser on modern principles in a modular approach using the existing Firefox code base using the existing modern Firefox code base, to be precise. They also knew that they wanted to have data about how this product or this browser behaves on actual end user phones. The landscape of Android is even wider than the hardware landscape for mainstream operating systems on the desktop. So it's even more out of scope to test it on all those platforms. But if we can get actual performance and usage data of the browser in the wild, then we can make decisions what works and what doesn't. Now, let's take a look into what the current Telemetry API as used in Firefox desktop looks like. This is a simple function call. Um, and all it does is it increments a counter that's identified by some name and increments that essentially by one. Now, the first thing you see is the function, the scalar at, which is called on some global telemetry object. Scalar is our naming of just a single value that can be changed. Second, you have a string that's used as the identifier for what we call the metric. That's the underlying data point that we actually want to collect. In this case, it's browser engagement max concurrent type count. In this case, the name to some extent already describes what this data should be. And then we increment it by one. Now you might wonder where does this data actually come from? And there is actually one single source of truth in the Firefox code base where this data is put in. That's Scalar's YAML. Scalar's YAML is a definition file that holds the identifier and a lot more metadata about this metric. It's organized into category and names, whereas 
In this case, browser engagement is actually the category, and then our name is my concurrent tab count. It has more data on there. For example, it lists the numbers of the bugs that implemented or changed this metric. It has a description so that everyone coming by can look up what this metric actually does. And at best, they don't need to know all the surrounding code where this data is actually collected to get an understanding of what they should be seeing. Then we have this expires field, which actually tells us that this data won't be collected beyond Firefox version 81. As said before, sometimes or most often, we don't actually want to collect the data for forever. Instead, we stop at a certain version to collect this data. And by then, whoever is responsible for this needs to make a decision about the data and how it answers the question. And last but not least, there's also some form of owner in this definition file. We have always at least someone assigned that's responsible for this metric. So if anything goes wrong there, or someone needs more information around this data, or needs to find some analysis that happened, they can look up who owns this metric and can talk to that person directly. And sometimes that's not a single person. Sometimes that's full team. So how would a de developer go from this block of definition in the YAML file to this API call? There's a couple of things that over the years we figured are actually not nice for the developers anymore. First of all, we're passing in some opaque string that's used as an identifier. But suddenly, there are like underscores and dots, and it's not really clear what's the pattern behind that. In the definition file, browser engagement was actually done with a dot, but here it's underscore. But then there's a dot between the category and the name. And all of this is very opaque to the, to the developer that needs to use this. Also, if they mistype this name, there's no indication that something doesn't work. They need to actually run this code, check that telemetry is recorded um, by doing the action they are uh, recording. And also, what if this is not a counter? What function do they need to call? Scalar add only makes sense for counters. So just from this idea, we can get to a point where we can design a nicer API already. So this is the API that we are aiming for. Let's split this up a little bit. We have browser engagement dot max concurrent top count dot add with a one. Now the browser engagement, that's a category and that's an actual object available in the source code. And the counter metric is now identified by an actual, uh, by an actual field on this object. And as we know this is a counter, we also know what methods a counter supports. In our case, that's add, because we only can increment this counter. And incrementing works with an amount, so we can pass it a positive integer. And because we have this definition file, we have all of this information about the metric readily available um, before compile time. So we can do stuff with it to expose all of this information to the developer. If we get to this API, what works automatically is tab completion for browser engagement and for max current tab count. What also works is tab completion for the right method that you can call on this. And you automatically get a type check for what needs to be passed to this method. So this is what we're aiming for. So let's sum up the telemetry requirements for this new system. First of all, we want to keep this declarative definition of the metrics. This scalar's YAML file uh, that we had, it should ex still exist in some form. We might even need to extend it a little bit. We also know that we, current, we first aimed for Android, so we needed to have this available in Kotlin. But the other thing we knew is that if we built the system, it needs to work on multiple platforms at some point because we also want to get that into our other products. And that could be iOS, that's our desktop browser shipped on multiple operating systems and potentially other applications as well. And to not redo all the work, all of this should be bundled in a single core implementation that can be used cross-platform. And last but not least, we want an ergonomic API. 
And as I said before, we're targeting different platforms, which also means we're targeting different programming languages in which those products are implemented. And we want essentially the same nice API, but with the right feeling per the language we're implementing it for. Now, Glean is the summary implementation of all of this. Glean is the project um, that we built with a Rust core library that extends to multiple platforms, which we now all support. So let's dive into the Glean SDK stack. This is a very rough overview of what the Glean SDK looks like. On the top, you have the different app implementations. You have an Android app, you have an iOS app, and potentially other ones that I didn't even draw yet on this screen. Each of these apps uses the Glean SDK as a dependency and calls into it. And the top layer of the Glean SDK is the language implementation. That's either Glean Kotlin, which provides us with Kotlin bindings and also Java bindings. Then there's Glean Swift, which gives us a Swift API on top of all of this. And then we have a couple of more. Just below that, we have the Glean FFI. That's the connecting layer between the high level dynamic language for the app and the lower level actual implementation of Glean. On the side, we have this little tool called Glean Parser, which is a little connection between the definition file as seen before that generates code so the Android and iOS developers can actually benefit from having this information laid out as objects and available in the editors. So let's look at the lowest layer first, Glean Core. Glean Core is a plain old Rust crate. It contains uh, some structs, and those structs hold some state about how Glean works. It uh, holds the database. It knows how to write and read from the database. It keeps track of some internal metrics. So we not only measure the application, but we can also measure uh, Glean itself and provide um, some metrics that are used in essentially every implementation as well. Now, the advantage of this is this is really just a Rust crate. All the Rust tooling works. We can Rust, we can test this by just running Cargo test, and it works. It works on every normal operating system, be that Mac OS, Windows, or Linux. And that makes development of this part really, really comfortable for us. We can rely on all the nice things Rust provides for us. We can rely on its guarantees. We can use the ecosystem and use other crates available. We also implement all the metric types we support. Um, this is essentially a very um, simplified version of the counter we talked about before. A counter has an add function with an amount. And all it needs to do is look into the database and increment whatever is in there. We have some other metrics that are a bit more complex, but all most of the logic for them is still implemented in Rust, which allows us to test them individually. Now, just above this Glean Core implementation is the Glean FFI. This, again, is the connection layer between the Kotlin implementation and the lower core layer. FFI stands for a foreign function interface. Rust, from the beginning of um, it becoming a thing, was able to interface with other programming, programming languages through this foreign function interface, FFI. For simplicity, the FFI is essentially a deterministic and simple naming of um, symbols, such as functions, as you have them. And it's also the C-compatible ABI, that's the application binary interf interface, which essentially describes how things are laid out in memory um, and how functions need to get called and where to pass parameters into those functions. Rust is able to cross the FFI in both directions. The first is calling C functions. That's when you want to integrate an existing external C library and use that to do your work. The way you do this is you need to copy and convert the declarations of all the function calls that you know from this library 
into its Rust equivalent. You then put them in this extern block and then also need to uh, swap around the types so that you're not using the C types, but using their equivalents in Rust. And then you can just call this as if it is a normal Rust function. During the build, this all hopefully gets linked together properly and you get a working library out of this. Of course, this is all very, very unsafe in terms as Rust defines unsafety. Because you're crossing over in C land, you can't rely on all the nice things that Rust provides you, such as ownership and borrowing, lifetimes, or even the layout of certain data things in memory. Now, the other way works just as well. You can get called from C as well. For this, you need a little bit more annotations to make it all work. The first one is, uh, if you see on the slide here, is a Rust implementation of a function we're going to be able to call from C. The very first thing you see is the no mangle attribute. This attribute tells the compiler to use the function name as is and place it into the final library. If you don't have this, the compiler will actually change the name to encode a little bit more information into the, type, into the name of the function. But to be callable from C, you need the plain name. The next thing that you see is this extern C annotation. This tells the compiler what ABI it should expect for this function. And in this case, the ABI describes how parameters are, arguments are passed into the function and how you, um, how you return data from this function whether that's through the stack or certain registers. Now, the C ABI is much less um, expressive in what it can do compared to what Rust is able to do. So you will always have the case that you need to convert into something that the C side can actually understand. And you can always see on this little example, one of the cases where that, is the, where, where that comes out. And that's strings. In C land, strings are always encoded with a null byte at the end. Whereas in Rust land, strings always carry the length. So you need to convert back and forth between those. Luckily, Rust has tooling for that. You can just use the C string, which is essentially a wrapper around the Rust string, which appends the null byte and gives you a pointer to it. Next up, to make this all work, you actually also need the declaration of your function in C. So C knows what to call and um, the compiler knows how to do this. Usually you would write this somewhere in a code or provide a header file, but there's a tool that does this for you. C bindgen can create the C header automatically if you, do, if you expose a public C API. So again, on the left side, you have the Rust code which this, uh, implements a Rust function that is exposed as a C API function. And if you throw this against C bindgen, you get the output on the right. And that's the declaration in C syntax. This is really, really a nice tool, especially once you grow beyond just a single function. So you don't need to type it out all the time and you definitely don't make mistakes when typing it out. One more thing that we use in Glean is the crate called FFI support. FFI support is a small library that helps us simplify implementing all these FFI stuff. It's not written by us, but by another team at Mozilla, the application services team. They do essentially similar things as we do, writing Rust libraries and shipping them to mobile platforms. They came up with FFI support, and we are very happy users and contributors to this crate as well. One thing FFI support uh, gives us is the into FFI trait. The into FFI trait is a mechanism to express how to convert Rust types into FFI compatible types. With an other few little things in the code, this allows us to basically write Rust code and then have the conversion to a C compatible type done automatically whenever we pass this through our FFI functions. 
I said before, there's C string that does this for strings. And FFI essentially reuses that for strings, but implements it for other types as well. Another thing FFI support brings us is FFI string. I mentioned strings a couple of times now um, as now terminated uh, list of bytes. What FFI string gives us essentially a safe wrap around this. So when we get a string passed in, we actually have a Rust type we can work with. We can turn this into an actual Rust string or read data out of it. FFI string also adds lifetime to what we get in. So we can rely on the compiler to tell us if we misuse this data. We, can for, we cannot, for example, store this data anywhere. If we want to do this, we actually need to allocate it into an actual Rust string and store that away. The C side on uh, could just remove this data after this function returns, so we can't rely on it. The third thing we get from FFI support is the concurrent handle map. This is essentially a locked map that gives us handles to the data we insert. These handles can be expressed as simple integers, and simple integers we can just pass back over the FFI. When we get back such a handle, we can get back to the object that is saved under this handle. And we can also ensure that the handle we got actually maps to the type that we expect. If you would use pointers to any of the data, the other side could easily screw up the pointer handling or pass pointers in the wrong place. And we would never know until we actually see a crash. By using a concurrent handle map here, we get another benefit. This is all behind a lock. So even if we get called from a multi-threaded application, we are automatically thread safe simply because our data is behind a lock and we never allow two invocations to run on that data at the same time. Now that we talked a lot about the FFI, let's talk about what the FFI compiles to. Let's talk about compile targets. Most people will probably write, compile, and run the Rust code on their own machine. You have your laptop, you type your Rust code, you type cargo run, it builds and runs the code. But sometimes you probably also want to compile to that other machine over there. And as it turns out, you're programming on Windows, but that machine over there is Linux because it's your server. So how do you do this? That part is called cross-compiling. Now, luckily, the Rust compiler is a cross compiler by default. It knows how to compile for other targets. If you're using Rust up, you can just type Rust up target list, and you get a list of all the targets that Rust actually knows. Now, these are over 80 targets that Rust up can already deliver to you. Now, why are some installed and why not? Well, there's still like some pre-compiled libraries like the standard library provided for all these targets. So you just need to download them first and then you can build your code. Now, what is a target you might, uh, might ask? Well, it's essentially the combination of the architecture, the operating system and the ABI you want. Now, sometimes there's an operating system, so it's just unknown. And most of the time, the ABI actually specifies what libc you're compiling against, which then makes certain assumptions about the ABI. The target is, is, is expressed as a tri triple. Now, the triple has three to five components, as you see here, and depending on who you ask. And I'm not totally ignoring the one or uh, off by one or more error here. Now, this is the list of the 10 targets the Glean SDK actually compiles for. We have four targets for Android alone, um, for both ARM and x86. And one of them is actually the x86 emulator or simulator. Then you have your default targets for the mainstream operating systems, um, Linux, um, Mac OS, and Windows. And we also have two IRS targets, um, where the First one is the ARM target, that's the actual devices. And then you have the x86 target, which is the simulator running on your Mac. Now, there's one little detail that I basically skipped over so far in that Rust is a cross compiler, yes. But just by downloading those, 
it can compile for the target you're specifying, but it will most likely not produce a workable library or binary for you to use. And the reason is Rust has no idea about the linker and the additional libraries that any of these targets need. So you most likely will need some more setup to get this all working. We brought this down for our part and it's actually not too complicated anymore, but it's certainly a thing that you need to think about. We compile for these targets on CI, so every release build is definitely built for all these targets. And that gets a bit hairy to get it all working. But once you get it there, um, you can mostly rely on it. Next up, we're going to look at the Glean Kotlin implementation. I explained the cork rate and I explained how the FFI provides a layer on top of that. Now we're looking at the implementation that application is going to use. And we are specifically going to look at the Kotlin implementation. I'm going to make some comments about the others afterwards. Now, how do you make Kotlin talk with a C API, which is provided by the Glean FFI? If you look that up, the first thing you find is JNI. JNI, and here I quote, is the Java native interface. It defines a way for the bytecode that Android compiles from managed code to interact with native code. Managed code here means Kotlin or Java, Java and native code here means anything that exposes the C API. That could be C, for us it's Rust. Now, JNI is a bit special. Um, there's a crate out there called JNI, which provides you a lot of the things around this to make this all work. But let's look at a Hello World example for JNI. On the left, you see the Rust code that's necessary to make JNI work. Again, you have this no mangle attribute to tell the compiler not to mix up the name. Then you have an extern system declaration. That's essentially extern C with a little bit of other details on some platforms. And then you have the function name. And the function name here is java underscore hello world underscore hello. And that's already kind of awkward. You need to encode actual information into this type so the JNI side can find this. On the right side, you see the Java code that is able to call the native code here. You have some class hello world. You define that there is a static method, sorry, a static method called hello with string input and output, and then you also need to load the library. And if you see both sites now, you see that the Java class hello world is actually what's encoded into the function name on the Rust side. Now, I don't want to write code like this, and I certainly didn't. But if you're interested in this, definitely check out Otavio's talk from last year's Rust Latem about how they wrote a project that interoperates with Android, iOS, and WebAssembly. Now, as I said, I don't want to write code like this, and I certainly didn't. So what are other ways to do this? Uh, to repeat, we wanted to connect Kotlin with the underlying FFI library that's written in Rust. And the next project you're stumbling across, if you look this up, is JNA. JNA is the Java native access. And I quote again here, JNA provides Java programs easy access to native shared libraries without writing anything but Java code. No JNI or native code is required. Again, Java here you can replace with Kotlin. The same applies. We can talk to some native code that C or Rust or whatever looks like C and can call this. So let's look how the hello world for this looks like. And this is the hello world code. That's essentially the same code I sh I've shown before. We have our no mangle attribute, we have extern C. We define our function with its normal name and then we pass around what's essentially C types. On the Kotlin side, we need to load this library and it looks like a little bit more code, but just um, it's not really. You just need to tell it the name of the library that you're loading. Then you need uh, to list out all the declarations of the functions that are available on this library. And later, as seen in the last um, line, you can call this as if it was pure Kotlin code. Under the hood, JNA 
takes care of passing things back and forth over the FFI. Now, to fit this all together, there's one more thing we need. We need to integrate this into the build system. Android applications use Gradle as their build system most of the time. Now, luckily for me and my team, we didn't need to write anything to make this all happen. Others figured this out before us. As I said, the application service team was a bit quicker in building the project. So they built the Rust Android Gradle plugin that essentially gives us um, what you see here on the slide. We can add this little cargo block into our build files. We give it the name of what we're trying to build and where to find the code. And we also tell it the targets it needs to compile for. Now, whenever we run a full Gradle build of our library, this plugin under the hood invokes cargo, finds the right tool chains and compilers and linkers for the Android platforms. It does that through the Android SDK and NDK as you've installed it. Invokes cargo, compiles that, copies the generated library into some place that your Kotlin code will actually be able to load it. So that was the Kotlin implementation. Let's briefly look into other Glean implementations. The very first one, and that's on the slide, is Swift. Swift is, was comparably easy to the Kotlin implementation because Swift actually speaks C. So what we do is we use C bindgen to generate a C header. Then we put that all into the build system, and that's actually the most complicated part of it. And then we are able to call the Swift side from uh, the Rust side from Swift. There's a bit um, translation sometimes needed between different data types, but all in all, it's not that much magic after all. The next implementation we had was Python. Uh, Python again is pretty similar conceptually to the Swift implementation. We're using CFFI, a Python library that can also load the C header. And at runtime, it then loads the dynamic library and provides us access to the methods that we uh, defined in the C header. There's a little bit more involved to convert between Python types and C types, simply because Python has a very different layout of types than C expects them. But with some tooling and utilities, that's not actually too much work, except needing to write all of this. Now, the newest addition in the family of language implementations of the Glean SDK is C Sharp. Implementation-wise, this is pretty similar to Kotlin. We list out all the declarations of all the FFI functions converted to C Sharp, uh, replace some of the C types with their equivalents in C Sharp. Then we load the generated library at runtime and can call methods on it. No, there are more implementations actually coming up that we're working on. And one of the first one is C++. We're bringing back Glean into Firefox desktop and Firefox itself is still mostly written in C++. So that's where we need to provide an API for. Firefox is also written in JavaScript to a large extent. So we're also gonna have a JavaScript API soon. Because of how Firefox on desktop works, there's a slight shift in how we need to design this. And a lot of the parts are already in Firefox to make this all happen. So if you're using Firefox nightly, you will soon actually use Glean as the telemetry system inside Firefox, as one of the telemetry systems. And last but not least, we're actually working on a Rust API. Now you might wonder, wait, you're writing Rust, why don't you have a Rust API? The reason is, Glean Core is written in a way that the Glean FFI can expose all its functionality. But we didn't bother yet to provide a nice API on top of all of this to make it usable for us users. We simply didn't have anyone that needed that. But now we have the first requests to actually provide a Rust API, not only in Firefox desktop, but also outside. So we're going to work on a Rust API that's usable simply as a Rust crate. Now, I'd like to 
Now with the implementations out of the way, I'd like to jump over in some of the challenges we were facing when developing a cross-platform library. Not everything there went smoothly and there were a lot of things we had to figure out. The very first thing, and that came up a lot already, is data types. The data types Rust knows, the data types that are expressed in C, and the data types that are available in all the other languages we're targeting, they are very different. So we always need to convert between those. Now, the first one we need to look at is numbers. These are actually pretty simple. Numbers, the number types in Rust all have their bit width defined. And there are equivalents in both Kotlin and Swift and in the other languages we implement as well. A little bit of care needs to be taken for I size and U size, which are platform defined uh, size types. Um, they do have their equivalents in both Kotlin and Swift and the other languages, but you need to make sure that you're actually using those when passing data over the FFI in any of these types. One little nit there as, as well, Kotlin and Java don't really have unsigned integer types. So what we defer to is we just mostly use sign types whenever we can, so we don't get a mismatch between the sites. There's experimental support for unsigned integers in Kotlin, so you could use that and rely on that as well. The next type we need to look at is a bool. A bool is essentially one bit of information. It's either true expressed as a one or it's false expressed as a zero. That's one bit. Now, the size of a bool in Rust is actually eight bit, one byte. The reason behind that is we can't really address smaller than one byte. So that's not too bad. Where it goes bad, or it goes wrong is when we try to interface with Kotlin. Because the way Kotlin sees bools is, well, 32-bit, that's four bytes. That's not only a waste of memory space that we're using up for a simple one bit of information, this is also a complete mismatch between the two sites. So we can't pass over bools over the FFI. What we do is we always convert them to U8 or byte on either side, and then just compare whether we got a one or zero to get out of bool again. The next thing are strings. We use strings heavily. If you use strings as parameters to the, your FFI functions, you're in luck. Um, JNA and also the implementations on other platforms essentially are able to take their version of a string and convert that into a C string. So if you pass over a Kotlin string into the FFI, under the hood, JNA allocates new block of memory for that string, copies over the string UTF-8 encoded, if you tell it so, adds the null byte, and then passes over a pointer to this allocated data. After the function call, it will actually also make sure this data is deleted again. So what you get on the Rust side is this um, FFI string that we can then deal with. And yes, that always includes this double allocation. And that's a bit unfortunate, but for us, that's not really a performance bottleneck at all. The next thing is getting out strings, returning them from your FFI. That's a bit more complicated overall. The way we do this is we allocate a Rust string inside the Rust layer. We then turn that into a C string using, um, which adds the null byte. And then we return a pointer to this data and also need to make sure we're not deallocating that data. On the Kotlin side, we get this pointer and then need to get the data out. Some utility functions, again, make this really easy for us. First of all, on the bottom, you see get string. This just reads out the null terminated string from the pointer, 
reads it as UTF-8 encoded data and turns that into a Kotlin string. On the top is the function that developers would actually, or that we actually use in the Kotlin bindings, get and consumer string. The little detail you need to know here is that you also need to ensure that the uh, allocation on the Rust side is freed again. So when we copied out the data, we tell the FFI to just deallocate the just allocated string again. Now again, we have this double allocation where Rust allocates, then Kotlin allocates, copies our data, and then tells Rust to deallocate again. So there is a bit of a overhead there. We use strings as return values very sparingly, so it's not a big deal for us. The next thing we use is enums. Um, plain old enums are just a list of the variants they have. Essentially, each variant has an integer representation. And for now, we're actually just using this integer representation. We convert it to the integer and turn it back into the enum on the Rust side. Now, there's one little detail that um, makes this a little bit of a hassle, and that we need to ensure that both the Kotlin side and the Rust side agree exactly about the order of variants in the enum and also the values of the enum. Luckily, if you don't tell them otherwise, they will both start counting at zero. So you can pretty much rely on that. We need to do this translation all manually, but this is certainly a part which we could automate eventually. Now, Rust actually has another enum type. Well, it's not another type, but it's an extension of enums. Enums can carry data. By this, you're allowed to have different variants carry different data, and the whole thing is still a single type. Now on the left, you see a somewhat weird looking uh, enum in Rust, because this actually includes some C compatible types. This is the enum we use on the FFI layer. And there's one little annotation on top of that. They represent U8. This is specified in Rust. And what it does, it turns this enum when converted into a C type into essentially a tagged union and uses a tag that's represented as a U8. That's one byte. This tag then essentially just encodes which variant the union has. That is one of the three variants in this example. On the right side, you see what this tag union would look like in C. This is what C bind gen actually generates from this representation of the enum. At first, you get the different tags. Then you see that the tag is actually encoded as the U and 8, which is the 8-bit integer. And then for each variant that has data, we have their own struct. In this case, we have the upload body, which contains the document ID and the body that you also see in the Rust code. But at the very first field, it contains this tag. And last in this sample of code, you see the union. Now, C Bindgen is actually smart enough to see that neither wait nor done have additional data. So all the information you need to carry around for them is the tag. They don't need their own structure. Upload, on the other hand, does need the structure. And making this a union means that the union simply has the size of the biggest of its variants, which in this case is the struct. But because the tag is always the first uh, variable in this whole thing, you can always read out the tag and get valid data back. And if it points to upload, you are allowed to read the upload body. Now, this is the C version. Luckily, we can translate that into Kotlin quite easily. JNA, the library we're using, has implementation of both structure and union. So with a little bit of boilerplate that we type out, we essentially replicate this tagged union in Kotlin. There's one little nit again. This is mostly a manual process, translating the Rust code on the left to the Kotlin code on the right. And that is a little bit annoying. And if you get this wrong, you might accidentally read uninitialized memory. And that's not good. So you need to make double sure that both sides agree on how the data looks like. This is also a part where I'd like to see this just being automated. 
I'm pretty sure it would be possible. If you actually want to pass over other data and return this from your FFI, one thing we do is we simply encode this as JSON. On the Rust side, we already heavily rely on Certit to do some serialization for us. So adding JSON serialization on the FFI was pretty simple. We turn our, we serialize our data into JSON, turn that JSON into a C string and return that C string. On the Kotlin side, we read the string, read it out as a Kotlin string, then parse the JSON and can then look at the JSON data. Again, this works for us because we only use this for our test functions. So we are first fine with the performance it provides us. And we're also fine with the little bit of overhead it has on us as developers where we need to ensure the JSON representation is seen the same on both sides, both in Rust and Kotlin. And the last thing is you could just drop all this and actually just use protobuf. That's what the application service team is using for much richer data they need to return. The advantage is they can define their data layout once and then have the proto com protobuf compiler generate both Rust code and Kotlin code. Then their FFI simply serializes the data into a protobuf, returns that over the FFI, and the Kotlin side deserializes that using the generated code and has an actual Kotlin object to work with. This not only gives you the safer translation where you don't need to do this all manually, it also is faster than parsing JSON. Now enough with the data types, let's look, let's look at a couple more things that we stumbled upon while implementing this. The first off is the optimizer on the Android side. R8 is a new optimizer and uh, Minifier written by Google. That's essentially a successor to the um, pretty well-known ProGuard tool in the Android world. R8 essentially takes the JVM bytecode, then minifies and optimizes this code. For a lot of application, this is very essential. The optimizations it can do are very impressive and really speed up certain applications a lot. The problem is it's pretty buggy in some places and it actually might over-optimize JNA code. There's a lot of things inside JNA and R8 can't look through all of these. And sometimes it just decides that it thinks some of this code is not needed, throws it away because that's an optimization but then your final application doesn't run anymore. There are a few things that you can do to um, prevent this. First of all, JNA actually tells you to include certain rules that ensure when R8 runs, it does not touch the JNA parts. Additionally, you probably want to tell it to not touch your own FFI code either. That's what the last rule does for us. There still might be bugs and we stumbled up on a big one. Uh, we found a workaround for that and we're hoping this bug actually gets fixed. But this is definitely, <clears throat> sorry. This is definitely a part that uh, cost me a lot of time uh, invested into trying to fix this. Now, one more thing I'd like to talk about is extra libraries that you need to include in your build. We're very lucky in that we need exactly one external library and that external library is compiled as part of cargo build. And that's statically compiled into our library through a build RS file. And that luckily just works. Now the problem is build RS is just pure Rust code. Anyone could do anything there. It's used to compile external libraries if needed, but everyone does it differently. Some library wrappers just look for the library in your system. That mostly doesn't work if you're cross-compiling. They might try to download this library and then compile it and then link it, but there's still the difference whether they dynamically link it or they statically link it. So my recommendation is if you actually need to do this, ensure that you're building and linking your C dependencies statically so they all end up in your final library. 
Otherwise, you also need to ship all these C dependencies compiled. And the second tip is consider pre-compiling the dependencies you have and ship them to your developers. Make them available somehow, especially if you have large dependencies. Not everyone has the full setup to also compile these. And sometimes it can be a real hassle. But your CI system probably already knows how to compile for all these different platforms that your developers are also using. So just pre-compile them, make them available to the developers, and that integrate that somehow into your build. Now, one thing you might now ask, so what about the platform? So far, we've only seen it talk one direction. And that's because it really only goes one direction. We are always calling Kotlin, we're always calling from Kotlin into Rust. We return data on this function call, but there is never a case where from the Rust side, we call back into Kotlin to invoke any platform behavior. I know that it can work, and the JN iCrate that I presented earlier is able to provide you the functionality to call Java or Kotlin code. So you could use that. But we don't do this, so I haven't looked much further into this. We, on the other hand, we do rely on Kotlin to do things for us and pass us that data. So some things that Kotlin actually does for us are getting the data storage path, because this differs on how it works on Android, where there's iOS, and certainly is completely different on desktop again. It also gets us some information about the system and the application, like version numbers and operating system versions, and so on. We also rely on Kotlin to do the HTTP or network communication for us. We essentially tell the Kotlin side, here's data, now use HTTP to upload it to this server. And the last thing we rely on for, for Kotlin is time. The time sources the Kotlin APIs use and the time sources that the REST APIs use are slightly different. And we haven't yet invested the time to simply move that over to Rust and use the right time sources there. So before I wrap this all up, I want to look a little bit ahead. For us, the future is certainly Glean. We use we deployed Glean on the new Firefox for Android browser, and it's an active use there. It's in a lot of different products at Mozilla already, and we're currently working on getting it into more to replace the old telemetry systems we had there. One thing I am looking forward to, because that was on my to-do list ever since we started, is some form of reducing the overhead we need to invest to write all this boilerplate to support all these platforms. Luckily, I'm not alone in this, and other people just do stuff faster than I do. And there is now a project called UniFFI that can create this boilerplate. Essentially, you can use IDL files, that's interface definition language files, where you describe your interface, what it should look like, and UniFFI will be able to take this, generate the Rust part so it can implement it, generate the FFI part so it can get called, and also generate the Kotlin part so you actually have the integration into the platform. It's not there yet, but this is something I definitely want to help out developing in the next few months. And then I talked about it a couple of times. We're bringing Glean back into Firefox and desktop. We call this Project Fog. We're currently implementing and designing the APIs we want to see there, like C++ and JavaScript, and also the REST API will be used there. And that's very exciting. And we hope to get this into Nightly and actually working in the next few months as well. One thing more that I wanted to achieve with this talk is, for one, putting out this knowledge. We're doing this. We're building cross-platform libraries targeting mobile. But I also want to reach out and see who else is doing this. The documentation around all of this is a little bit sparse. So I'd like to see this getting talked about more, more tools being developed for it, more documentation written around all of this. And as one last thing, because I find this highly interesting, and just to plant the seed in your head, 
Some of these platforms do have ways to do async programming, and now Rust has async programming. Is there a way we can combine those two things and do async Rust programming, but running it on the platform side? Now, thanks to my team at Mozilla, uh, Alessio, Bea, Travis, Mike, and also Georg, um, who are working with me on this project, and also the application services team that paved the way in a lot of places for us and who are still in contact with us to further develop these ideas. You find uh, the slides online. You find all of the clean, clean code base in the Mozilla slash clean repository on GitHub, as well as our docs. And you can read about Glean and how we develop it on our blog. You find me on Twitter. And now I have time for questions. Thank you. All right, I'm getting some questions in. Um, the first is from uh, Dowie on Twitch. How little Kotlin or Java must one write so as to maximize use of Rust in mobile development? So that's a bit hard for, for me to describe precisely because a few things that I left out is that our first implementation was actually in Kotlin and we slowly migrated parts of it to the Rust site and using the Rust implementation. So we already had a lot of Kotlin that we just migrated. Um, I'd say you also need to look at how much you actually depend on using Rust. For us, it was clear that we need to share this implementation and that we can put a lot of logic into this Rust implementation, whereas the Kotlin parts are pretty much stateless. And I think that's where it shines really well. If you know that you need to do a lot of interaction between those two sites, it might not be optimal anymore. So how little or how much you need to write, hard to say. Next, also from Twitch, from Rarity, is Kotlin native multi-platform at all useful in interacting with FFI? I don't know. I have not looked at Kotlin native. Um, so Kotlin native is a way of compiling Kotlin to actual native code and not to JVM bytecode. I have not looked at this, so I don't know how it interacts with FFI. What I do know is that it would not have been a possibility to just use Kotlin and get that back into the Firefox desktop code base, because that would have been yet another language that we would need to support and that would not have flown with the Firefox development team. Another question from Twitch, uh, Dowie again. To what extent have you needed to put deliberate effort for mobile FFI development into keeping Rust objects alive for longer than Rust would typically keep them alive? So there's two parts where we need to do this. Um, we Essentially, Glean is a global singleton. So we simply put that in a global static. Um, that's behind a lock to be kept alive. So it essentially lives for forever. Um, that would have been the case if we not done any FFI either. It's just that we need this global singleton to get to the API we want to. The other thing where we need to ensure things live are those metric types that we create on the Kotlin side through the FFI. But there we essentially rely on these on this concurrent handle map from FFI support. I'm sorry, the concurrent handle map. And that's also just a global static where it puts in the data, which ensures it lives until we delete it again. The place where we need to do some effort, and again, that's wrapped around um, nice types for us, is returning strings. If you return strings, you need to make sure that you allocate the data, then forget about it, but return the pointer so Kotlin can read it. And that's the one place where you need to do this. If you're not using concurrent handle map, you would need to do this for all your other objects. 
Um, follow up question from Dowi on Twitch again. Would it be more performant to use bytes rather than a string for exchanging JSON serialized data? Yes, it would because we can just um, we we wouldn't need to do the uh, UTF-8 check. Um, then again, JSON is UTF-8 data, so at some point this this would still come up. We could uh, use one less check there, but again. Um, we don't care about the performance there much. It's only returned from test functions, so it will never land in the application. Ariane on Twitch asks, where does Rust shine more than any other language in the industry? Oh, that, that puts me in a corner. I need to be very careful here. Um, where it really shines for us is simply all the safety it brings us. Um, the fact that we can simply rely on on being multi-threaded by default, we we don't need to take specific care of that. It just works, and the compiler will stop us if it doesn't. I think that's one of the major places where it shines, especially in this context. We can't fully control the Kotlin or Swift or Python site, and that might be multi-threaded. What we need to ensure that the internals in our Rust crate are thread safe. And the other thing is the tooling. Um, Cargo is just absolutely amazing. And for us, it was very easy to integrate that. Well, not very easy. It was considerably easy to integrate that into the other build sims as we needed it. And other tooling is just excellent as well in Cargo. And this is where I want to see UniFFI going. UniFFI should be one of those tools that you can just use and it just works. And that's where Rust is really excellent already. A comment on YouTube from Jeff. Uh, do you think it would be possible for Glean to be extended or built up on work, up on to work with distributed tracing? Seems like having a similar portable interface like this would be great. Um, I haven't yet looked at tracing too close. I think um, you're you're asking about the tracing crate, I assume. Um, a very new popular crate in the Rust ecosystem. Our what what I can say though is that our telemetry is slightly different from what tracing currently provides. Um, we're not so much tracing across code blocks but we're more gathering single points of data collected. This, in my examples in this talk, it was mostly counters, but what's much more used is distributions of time, distributions of memory. Sometimes it's lists of strings or similar things. I don't think tracing has APIs uh, similar to that. And implementation wise, I haven't looked at it at all. So I, I can't speak about that. One more question from Ariane um, on, on Twitch. Python for simplicity and data science, C++ for faster computation and low level stuff and JavaScript for rep. So where do you think Rust is an epic winner? Um, actually in all of these. Um, as shown, we are using Rust and interact with all these languages. I, I write C++ still as uh, as my main job requires that. I still write JavaScript because Firefox is also written in JavaScript and I do write JavaScript for the web sometimes as well. And I interact with Python a lot, not only because half our build system now uses that, but also, as you said, it's used in data science a lot. And I think Rust positions itself very well to be the language behind the scenes. It can be used to implement all these things that needs to be fast in the background, and the other languages can provide the nice user API. Um, well, C++ is the one case where they ba basically compare speed-wise, but the other languages, not necessarily. So I think this being the language behind the scenes, essentially being the system spreading the language behind all these things, that's where Rust fits right in. So that's about the questions I have at the moment. Um, I give you all a couple more minutes to um, ask me anything.
All right, there's one more question from Scripted Fate. Um, that's, that's more of a comment, but I'm still going to read it because it's essentially one of the answers to the earlier questions. Um, there, there's a work on open tracing. Um, and yeah, um, to, for context, CryptoFate is one of my colleagues. Um, it's not unreasonable to think of an evolution in that direction, but for now, Glean is focused on higher level metrics, not traces. Yeah, so th this essentially sums it up. Um, currently, we're focusing a lot of on the higher level metrics. So I use counter because that's the easiest, but we try to come up with the metrics in a way that the metric itself has semantic meaning for what it wants to collect. As I said before, we have these distributions, but our distributions are specific to either be timing distributions, which mean they measure a time span, or memory distributions, which mean they measure some form of memory that could be allocation, that could be disk space used, or um, memory used for the JavaScript engine or sorts like that. We're also getting new types to measure rates. Um, that is that is useful where we need to compare certain things that happen on a website, um, where we know that um, whether something is available and whether something is actually used. And we have a whole process to build out these types. Um, another question from Trich and Dowie, and that's that's actually a pretty good one. Um, why do we use Kotlin for the network communication rather than Rust? Um, the reason is that, so there are multiple reasons actually. So in Firefox for Android, the Android browser we're building, we're actually using Gecko. That's the same engine that's used in Firefox desktop. And that engine brings its own HTTP stack. That's the whole implementation of the network communication is done. And on Android, we actually want to use this implementation of the network stack. So we need to pass it back on through Kotlin. And then the fun fact in Firefox for Android, the data actually gets passed back into Gecko, which is a C++ implementation that then does the network communication for us. We can implement this in Rust as well, but again, on Firefox for Android, we wouldn't. We could do this on other platforms, but we still want to leverage simply the existing network stacks that are there. Um, Android has a network stack and that's deeply integrated with the system, which also allows you to schedule uploads the same on Swift. You can schedule uploads and the system actually does it for you without you needing to control everything. That actually also allows for upload in the background. And it's the same on other platforms. We can't necessarily rely on a new network, implement, network stack implementation in Rust because the system might use something different to begin with. Flaky on Twitch asks, do you see Glean having use cases in other products? Are there any others who are using it or looking into using it? Is there a plan to make it friendlier for others and drive outside adoption? Um, to all of this, I can answer yes. Um, Glean was developed at Mozilla with the specific needs that we have, but we developed it in a way that the implementation can essentially talk with any pipeline that adheres to the same things. Um, if you watch our, if you uh, keep an eye on our blog, there will soon be a blog post about how you can use Glean and not use the Mozilla pipeline to get to the data. So that's actually one of the things we want to do. We want to turn Glean into something that others could use as well to profit from the same things we are already putting into Glean. Um, another comment, uh, question from Jeff on YouTube. Do you have a favorite Rust crate for working with errors? Um, I do not. Um, I hear this error is pretty good. Um, I actually ripped out all usage of failure in our code base and part of our dependency tree because the overhead it introduced was bigger than just implementing the enums ourselves and then implementing error. Um, the reason we don't really depend on any error crate for this is 
the APIs we provide actually don't report errors. We went to great length to ensure that under um, correct use, and like most of it is guaranteed by Rust, um, you can't run into errors. Uh, the errors you can run into are all handled internally. If we can't write to the database for whatever reason, we still don't want to crash any application that we're integrating with. If you can't write to the database, then so be it. The application still runs. If, however, we, we try to write into a metric type and some of the types don't match or some integer overflows or something like that, we actually use our own system to report these errors so we see them in the data. So if anything is, is wrong with the data we're trying to record, we record an error in our own data, and then we see it. So we're never exposing any errors from the Rust code over the FFI. So we don't need such a crate at the moment. I got one okay on Twitch asks, um, what do you not like about Rust? Um, I've been doing Rust for so long. There are certainly things uh, that are not perfect. Um, all in all, it's still more bearable than other languages that I'm working with. One thing, and for all the greatness that Cargo is, it cost me quite some headache because of some things it does. Um, essentially, the way features are handled um, still has a lot of problems, and that didn't really cause problems directly for Glean, but integrating Glean into a project as large as Firefox causes us problems because of the way Cargo uses features. Luckily for me, this is actually fixed and hopefully getting stabilized with the next Cargo release. So one of the pet peeves I have with, with Cargo is going to get fixed. X Sakash on Twitch asks, do you also plan to build two WASM for to JS? So to WebAssembly to use it in JavaScript. Um, this, idea, this idea flows around in our team quite often, to which my standard answer is, why? Um, the way Glean is currently designed, it works for big applications that are running for a long time that can send data in the background and collect metrics over time. That's the current design of Glean, and that works for browser type applications quite well, be that on mobile or on desktop. The JavaScript API inside Firefox has a lot of direct integration with the C and Rust, C++ and Rust part of Firefox, so we can't use WebAssembly there um, because we still need to call into the native code anyway. For websites, I still can see some form of Glean being used, but I don't see the Glee, current Glean design working out for a website because in a website, even in a um, single page application, you have this, you don't have this long running thing. You at potentially any time this tab, your website could just reload. You don't have any real persistent storage. So you can't store that forever offline, but you need constant communication with the server. The way we bundle up metrics into pings also doesn't lend itself very good for a website. On a website, if you need some statistics or metrics about your data, you probably want to send them out quickly. So you send out small packets and you send them out before the user leaves the website again. So I don't see the need to compile to WebAssembly. It could just be compiled to WebAssembly. Um, I assume, and it could run in some of the WebAssembly interpreters because the core crate is just Rust and a little bit of C. All right, so thank you for all the questions. Um, there were some really good ones in there. And now I'm actually tasked with selecting one of these as a good one. Um, Let's see. Uh, 
So I think the, one of the interesting questions here um, was from, from Dao here on Twitch about um, what was the effort to ensure Rust objects live longer than Rust usually would do. Um, I answered that um, we, we don't need to do much for that. We rely on our other tooling to do that. But there are ways in Rust to do this on your own by just allocating stuff and then forgetting about it and returning pointers. So that was definitely one of the good questions. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for watching. It was a lot of fun. Um, thanks. <laughs>